folks. This is For the Quantum Grammar Shoot 132, and we need to talk. If you want to know the intro to this show, you can go to any of the 131 other episodes and listen to that intro. But for this one, I'm going to dive right into it. Folks, there's a couple things I'd like to talk with you about. Directly related to the psychology of correct sentence structure communication parsing syntax grammar, i.e. quantum grammar. The first one is the manner in which you, and I mean you, Y-O-U, using the plain, simple English terminology, adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, you, the listener right now, the way you study, the way you research, the way you ask questions. I've had a YouTube channel for over six years, I think. Regular viewers are probably tired of hearing me say I have 900-ish videos. I don't really know how many they are. there are, but I've been saying I have about 900 videos for about half a year now, so I'd have to think there's actually a lot more than that now, but I'll just say 900. A good percentage of those, well, 132 of those videos have to do with correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, psychology. That's for the quantum, quantum grammar shoot. That's what you're listening to right now. There's 132 episodes of that. There's also a psyche playlist. So this is something that I've brought to the table that no one else spoke about before I came onto the field. To me, it's the most important thing. The most important element in learning this grammar is correct psychology. The reason being, if you don't have the correct mindset, and by correct, I mean together along the same path, the same straight path, same straight line. If you don't have that, then where are you going to be? As others are fond of saying, you're going to be wrong learning. You might be learning things but they're not going to help you with actually practically using this grammar in everyday scenarios when you have to. So it's very important to develop these uh, concepts and learn these mechanics and be able to use them. One method that I've suggested to my listeners and viewers and students is to Perform a side study of the trivium method. Trivium. T-R-I-V-I-U-M. Method. You can look that up on Google and find it fairly easily. Also, folks, I apologize. I have something going on with my throat. I have a frog in my throat for some reason. So, I apologize for that. The trivium method will give you the tools to learn any topic on your own by yourself. As a caveat to that, I would say that the only topic that you probably won't be able to learn by yourself using the trivia method is correct sentence structure. Because I did a two-year study on the trivia method, and the trivia method is grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And so it's obviously plain, simple English grammar. So what I did after my two-year study, and then I learned correct sentence structure, as I replaced fiction grammar with with quantum grammar. So quantum grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Quantum grammar, quantum logic, quantum rhetoric is, I guess, one way to say it. That's what I did. You don't have to do what I did, but it's a suggestion. It will greatly enhance your knowledge cultivation capacity, and skill to learn something on your own. The reason I bring this up is because I will get comments in my comments field that blow my mind. Now, when when I say that, right, 
When something surprises us or shocks us, I guess I'll bring it into the first person because I'm not going to try and assume that you think the way I think. But when something surprises or shocks me, it's usually because I'm projecting my personal biases onto what the other individual is doing. That's when something shocks or, or surprises me. Like if I see, uh, for example, uh, just a, a goofy example, an old lady fall down on the sidewalk and then I watch somebody walk by and not even look at her. I'm like shocked. Why, why wouldn't you help her? Because that's what I would do. So I'm projecting what I would do onto them. So that's basically what's happening. And it's probably the same for, for all you out there as well. We all do it, right? We're all brought up in the mindset of, well, we know what others should or shouldn't do, right? That's where the judgment comes in. But I definitely try and stay away from that. But I know what I would do. So to bring it back to the comments field, like someone asked me the other day on a very, very old video where I think it was a parse video where I parsed the word cure and, the par- and parse the word cancer. They literally asked me in the comments field, what is the opposite of cure? What is the opposite of cancer? Folks, to me, I'm like, what in the hell is this person on? Like, are they, are they, I don't even, okay. I'm not going to go into any of that. I don't want to try and make fun of the person or anything like that or even be cheeky about it because it's not funny. I wonder if this, I don't know who it is, if they're a young person, old person, what what they are. But I feel like this generation, these these most recent generations are educationally challenged. They're not taught to solve their own problems. They're not taught how to get answers to their own questions. Literally, folks. How do you find the opposite of a word? The quickest way, I mean, if you're typing in a comments field on YouTube, <clears throat> then that means you're on the internet. And if you're on the internet, then that means you have access to Google or DuckDuckGo or Bing or whatever. How hard is it to take a couple seconds and type in cu- antonym of cure, antonym of cancer? How hard is it to do that? <laughs> How hard is it to go to an online thesaurus, type in the word cure, and then look at the antonyms? Like, how does that thought not even enter into someone's mind before they decide to jump in the comments field and ask me that question? Yes, folks, there are no stupid questions. I agree. There are no stupid questions. But I guess for me, on my channel, I feel like the quality of question would not be of that caliber. That's like kindergarten question. If David Wynn Miller says, oh, we we all have a second grade reading level. Okay. Well, this individual probably has a kindergarten or first grade reading level if they don't know how to figure that out for themselves. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about correct psychology. When I went into this, I had the psychology that I could learn it and that I'm going to get all the answers I can by myself until I reach the point where I cannot any longer find the answer to something. Then I will reach out for help. Which brings me to the other topic, other psychological topic that I would like to discuss. And that is excuses. So my coolie on this individual was, do you have access to Google? If so, you can type in, and then I shared with them exactly what I just said to you about antonyms. You know what their response back was? Their response back was, I've been busy, too busy, blah, blah, blah. Now keep in mind, folks, the first comment that they left on the video was like six months ago. And then they commented again recently. So in all that six months, they did not 
have 30 seconds to look up the antonym for cure or cancer. They've been too busy to do that. How does that sound to you? Because I know how it sounds to me. Now I'm going to go into this, uh, this particular field a lot deeper right now because this is going to pertain to my students as well. Students and potential students, folks that I have consultations with, so on and so forth. A lot of times what I'll do, folks, if you do a consultation with me, <clears throat> and this may be wise, <laughs> some folks may find me intimidating or may be a little bit scared to do a consultation with me. And it, I don't think it has anything to do with me. I think it has to do with them. Because I will ask folks, on a scale of 0 to 100, what do you think your percentage of quantum grammar knowledge is? Where do you think you fall? On a scale of 1 to 10, where do you think you are? As far as, you know, 1 being a beginner, 10 being a master. Where, where are you at on the quantum grammar scale? And a lot of folks want to say or articulate that they know more than they actually do. Like they think they know more than they actually do, or they want me to think that they know more than they actually do. And they certainly want others to think that they know more than they actually do. So I'll take that to heart. I'll say, okay. So you think you know it 75%? Bam, I'll put them on the spot. I'll ask them to syntax something. Without fail, they will not be able to do it. And then they'll make excuses. They'll say, well, you know, normally I can syntax very easily, but I don't have my papers here. I don't have my syntax key here. Well, guess what? If you can't syntax a sentence without having a physical syntax key in front of you, then you don't freaking know how to syntax. You, you don't have that knowledge. That's knowledge you have to go outside of yourself for. So therefore, you don't have that knowledge. So if you say you're 75%, no, you're not. You're about 25%. Or the other one, like uh, I'll have students that... What normally happens is, uh, you know, I'll send out the workshop materials and then I will schedule the workshop uh, about 72 hours to a week out from the time I send the workshop material to them. So they have at least 72 hours to study what I send them, if not a week or more, depending upon, you know, people's schedules and things like that. So we'll sit down and I'll ask them, did you get a chance to watch the videos I sent? Yes, yes, I did. Did you get a chance to look at the worksheets I sent you and, and go over them? Yeah, yes, I did. Cool. Then we start getting into it. And then they start having difficulty in finding it a challenge, the worksheet, as we go on through it. <clears throat> and I can watch the sort of, I guess, insecurity come over their face when I start asking them, oh, why are you saying that word is tangible? Why is that word non-tangible? Did you look it up? Rhetorical question, folks. Because 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they will say no, they did not look it up. Because they didn't do the work. Then the same thing happens. They will start making excuses. Well, I've been really busy. I really didn't get to devote the time I wanted to to this. They start making excuses rather than just saying, no, I didn't. For whatever reason, I just didn't do it. I realized I got to start doing that. No. They don't take accountability for themselves. They just try and make excuses. And folks that do that are going to find it very, very challenging to learn this. Until they start being completely and totally accountable for what they're doing with this grammar, whether it's a priority or not a priority, if they take quote-unquote stewardship of that, they're, they're going to have trouble learning it. 
And that is also uh, cultivating humility. If you have the humility to not make excuses, if you have the humility to say, <clears throat> yeah, that's my fault. I haven't looked it up because I'm lazy and I have to develop these work habits. Maybe I'm used to everything coming easy to me. This is not coming easy. It's a challenge. And I really got to step up my game. That, that's humility. But a lot of folks just don't have it in them to do that just yet. I'm not saying that they won't develop it over now space, you know, over time, they develop something like that. They develop good habits, but it's something that has to be cultivated. It's not something that just appears out of nowhere. And if you're one of those folks that keeps making excuses as to why you're not learning it, then you're probably going to be doing perpetual workshops for a long time. It's going to take you a lot longer than it would someone that has humility and takes stewardship of their study habits. Once in a while, I will get a student that will take a series of workshops. Um, they'll get a good grammar base. Okay, I'll give you one good example. This is a great example, the best example I can give you. One of my best students, one of my favorite students was an individual from Australia. They started out with the uh, Russell J. Gould contingent. They started out with a group of people that called themselves the Postmasters down in Australia. It was a group of folks who became members of whatever it was at the time, the Red Thumb Club, the Quantum Community, the... Syntax Learning Center, whatever they're calling themselves this week, they were members of that and communicating with them and learning from them. But this individual realized that there was something not quite right about those folks that were teaching it, that the grammar was not correct. So they came to me and we started doing workshops. And at first, it was quite a challenge. I was not sure. I mean, I had my doubts that this individual would be able to purge themselves of the incorrect knowledge that they had acquired through Russell's people and be able to do away with that and learn the correct base because they had already developed an incorrect base. It's very hard to... It's very hard to correct a wrongly crystallized center in this grammar. Once you develop bad habits, it's very hard to correct that. But it can be done. And this individual did it. It took like five, six workshops. And they were still coming to me saying, well, this individual over here said you do it this way. And then I would say, okay, what's their closure on that? Why, why do you think they do that? Did they tell you why they do that? Can you tell me how anywhere in this freaking cosmos would that make sense? For example, that the would be syntaxed as an adjective, as an adjective. Where, what universe would that happen in? And why would you do that? And they'd be like, well, you're right. I don't have an answer to that. They never said. They just said that uh, that's the way it's done. Well, don't you think there's something weird here? Because Russell's syntax and the is an adjective here, but on the Russell's adverb sheet, the is listed as an adverb. So what's going on here? They're like, yeah, you know. So they began to understand this. Then they were able to extricate themselves from the quote-unquote postmaster's group and do their own thing. And they became one of my best students. They got, if not 100% closure on the grammar, they were up there in the 90 percentile. And then they vanished. I didn't hear from them for a long time. 
I want to say like a year or more, I didn't hear from them. Usually what happens in an instance where someone stops taking workshops and then they try and pick up again, usually they have to start over from square one. Usually they've regressed so far back to a beginner, basically, and have to do everything all over again. This individual, not only did they maintain their knowledge level, but they actually got better by themselves over that year, whatever it was. And they, they were more advanced than they were in the last workshop that we took a year ago, which was super duper impressive to me. That is like the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. Very rarely do you ever see that in this domain. So kudos to that individual. They know who they are. I'm not going to say who they are, but they know who they are. And I hope they're doing well. So that, that's the, those are the two topics that I wanted to cover here. Number one, the psychology of self-studying, uh, doing things by yourself, developing good, cultivating good study habits to get answers to basic rudimentary first grade questions rather than <laughs> coming into a comments field and... Uh, Asking me a question like, what is the opposite of cure? Right? And the other thing was about making excuses. Taking accountability for yourself. <clears throat> cultivating humility. Man, I think I'm about to lose my voice. So I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, as they say, you know, like, subscribe share, turn your notifications on. Definitely share this with others. See if we can hopefully get up to over 6,000 subscribers this year. That would be cool. Because I've been kind of in this place of hovering around, a little over 5,000, hovering there for a while, like a year or two or more. And, you know, going by statistics... When your channel levels out like that, that usually means that that's all it's going to get. Like, it's not going to get any better than that. That that is your audience, that's what you have cultivated, and that's what you're going to get. Which is cool, too. I mean, that's cool, too. But it would also be cool to see something out of the ordinary happen and have this channel blow up. Personally, I don't think that will happen. Because personally... I know that the majority of folks out there, and I'm talking to you, listeners, for whatever reason, don't take criticism very well. Don't really want to be challenged too much. You want everything easy, want everything handed to them, spoon-fed to them. And this is not something that can be achieved, accomplished, or gotten closure on through spoon-feeding or through just handing something to someone. This is something that has to be earned through blood, sweat, and tears. And if you're not willing to do it, well, it is what it is, folks. That's why I say only the few, the one percentile, the elite of the grammar students will go on to get closure on this and also go on to be able to cultivate the skills to use that grammar knowledge in everyday practical dangerous scenarios under duress. Very, very, very few. Will you be one of them? Let's find out. <laughs>